LT in particular does a great job of controlling nasty fungal disease. Oh, those fabulous ferns. The bird's nest fern makes a terrific house plant and dog-friendly gardens. All that and more, so stay tuned. Anything that makes gardening easier. And with that thought in mind, I put together a few tips and tricks that I've gathered over the years aimed at doing just that. You know those salt deposits that form on clay pots? Well, in addition to being unsightly, the salt itself can be toxic to plants. And removing these deposits is no easy task. However, here's a formula that'll make the job a whole lot easier. Combine equal parts vinegar, rubbing alcohol, and water in a spray bottle. Apply the mixture to the pot and scrub with a plastic brush. And there you have it. I can't stand dirt under my fingernails, but I don't like wearing gloves while working in the garden. The solution? Why, soap, of course. And not after a day of digging in the dirt, but before. By drawing your fingernails across a bar of soap, you'll effectively seal the undersides of your nails so dirt can't collect beneath them. Then, when you're done working, you can use a nail brush to remove the soap and your nails will be sparkling clean. It used to drive me nuts when the line on my string trimmer would jam or break. But a few years ago, I learned a really slick trick that puts an end to those problems. I simply coat the line before installing it in the trimmer with a vegetable spray oil. And guess what? No more jams or breaks. This next tip really measures up. Lay a long-handled garden tool on the ground and next to it, place a tape measure. Using a permanent marker, write inch and foot marks on the handle. That way, when you're out working in the garden and you need to space plants a certain distance apart, from a few inches to several feet, you'll have a handy dandy measuring device in your hand. Okay, this next tip is for those of you who, like me, never seem to have any garden twine handy when you need it. Thread the end of a ball or canister of twine through the drainage hole in a small clay pot and set the pot upside down in the garden. Do that and you'll never go looking for twine again. By the way, these little clay pots also make really nice cloches for protecting tender plants from sudden overnight frosts or freezes. And they also work well as hose guides for protecting your plants as well. Drive a roughly one foot length of steel reinforcing bar into the ground with a hammer at the corner of a bed or near a prized plant and slip two clay pots over it one facing down, the other facing up. The guides will prevent damage to your plants as you drag the hose along the bed or near your prized plant. Store-bought plant markers are fine, but I really don't like the not-so-natural look of most of them. And besides, some of them can be really expensive. So here's a great and inexpensive way to create your own all-natural plant markers. Write the names of plants on the flat faces of stones of various sizes using a permanent marker and place them at or near the base of your plants. Got aphids? Well, you can control them with a strong blast of water from the hose, or you can use some insecticidal soap. But here's another suggestion, one that's a lot more fun. Get some tape. Wrap a wide strip of tape around your hand, sticky side out, and pat the leaves of plants infested with aphids. Concentrate on the undersides of leaves, because that's where the little buggers like to hide. Believe me, folks, this little trick works really great. It's just that my plants don't have any aphids right now, and I'm glad of that. Getting newly planted plants off to a good start requires regular watering, but too often gardeners either forget to water or they don't water enough to get moisture deep down into the root zone of plants. So what's the answer? Well, try bottle feeding your babies. Take the plastic pop or milk jug and punch a couple of dozen holes in it with a sharp nail. Bury the jug up to the neck as close to the plant as possible without damaging the roots and fill it with water. As you can see, the water will slowly seep out of the holes in the jug and ensure even moisture within and around the root zone of the plant. For a small plant, one jug is probably all you need, but for a plant this size, you can put as many as six jugs around its perimeter. The next time you boil or steam vegetables, don't pour the water down the drain. After all, it's full of nutrients, and it needn't go to waste. So after it cools, use it to water potted patio plants, and you'll be amazed at how the plants respond to the vegetable soup. 
incidentally, make sure you cook with unsalted water because excess salt can actually be toxic to plants. Oh, and one more thing. If you don't want to pour your brew right onto your plants, no problem. Just dump it right in the compost pile. Mm. And don't toss out leftover coffee or tea grounds either. Both can be used to acidify the soil around acid-loving plants, such as azaleas, rhododendrons, gardenias, camellias, even blueberries. A light sprinkling, say a layer of about a quarter of an inch, applied once a month will keep the pH of the soil on the acidic side. And chamomile tea in particular does a great job of controlling damping off an especially nasty fungal disease that attacks young plants quite suddenly. Just add a spot of cooled tea to the soil around the base of seedlings once a week. For my last tip or trick, as the case may be, I need some fresh herbs in a car parked in the sun. <laughs> Stay with me, folks. There's a method to my madness. You see, this is the quickest way in the world to dry herbs. Just lay a sheet of newspaper on the seat of your car, arrange the herbs in a single layer, make sure the windows are rolled up, and close the doors. And in the time it takes you to say tarragon, well, maybe a tad longer than that, your herbs will be perfectly dried, and what's more, your car will smell great. Now, to tell you the truth, I usually prefer to use my herbs fresh, but I do use this trick every now and then since, well, since I'm known to leave my gym bag in the car overnight. Woo! Up next, I've fallen in love with a spectacular group of woodland plants. Oh, those fabulous ferns. This program, like in my landscape, I rarely look at pretty pictures in garden books. Instead, I prefer to just take a walk in the woods. And the reason is simple. I think nature is by far and away the best garden designer. And as a result of all my wanderings, I've fallen in love with a spectacular group of woodland plants namely ferns. There's just something about them that I find irresistible, which is why I've planted well over a hundred of them here in my landscape. What I like most about ferns is their delicate foliage, which, though extremely varied, is unique in the plant world. Another cool thing about ferns is that they are among the oldest known plants, having been around since well before the dinosaurs roamed the earth. And now, let's have a look at some of my favorite hardy ferns. Topping the list is the autumn fern, a splendid example of how versatile ferns can be. Its bronze-colored fronds emerge in early spring, then turn green later in the season. And in mild climates, say zone six and south, the autumn fern is semi-evergreen even during the harshest winters. Autumn ferns, which by the way are native to China and Japan, are extremely easy to grow and extremely well behaved. That is, they don't spread. So all in all, I'd consider them the best choice for those of you interested in getting to know ferns better. Two more easy to grow candidates are the hay-scented fern and the ladies' fern. They're remarkably similar in appearance and can be found growing in the wild throughout much of North America. A word of warning, however, both the hay-scented fern and the ladies' fern can spread, sometimes to the point of being invasive. But that can be a plus if what you're trying to create is a nice woodland garden. Oh, and one more thing, the hay-scented fern can actually tolerate fairly dry soil and a good deal of sun. Here's a regal beauty. It's called a royal fern, and it is indeed fit for a king or queen, especially a tall one, because this fern can grow up to four feet tall. It requires fairly acidic soil and regular watering, but it's otherwise easy to grow. The cinnamon fern, which gets its name from the color of its new fronds, is a real showstopper. Hey, I didn't mean that literally. It too can get rather large, as in up to three or four feet tall. It grows best in constantly damp soil. Another popular favorite is the ostrich fern, which is also capable of reaching heights of up to five feet. The ostrich fern does have a tendency to spread via underground runners, especially in wet marshy areas, which is its native habitat. But in the landscape, it tends to be reasonably well behaved. The Japanese painted fern is a huge hit in landscapes these days, and for obvious reasons. Its silver-colored fronds and wine-red stems are a departure from the usual green. Colors vary somewhat from plant to plant, but all are beautiful. And if kept well watered during the hot summer months, the Japanese painted fern will last well into late fall. One of the most delicate of all hardy ferns is the common maidenhair fern. 
It's a dainty dandy that's easy to grow, but it must be kept moist at all times, especially in the South. And as you might guess, due to its delicate appearance, the common maidenhair fern simply won't perform well in hot, dry climates. But there are tropical maidenhair ferns that grow well in zones 9 and 10 in the ground and in pots on the patio pretty much everywhere else. A great performer in the south, however, is the southern wood fern. It grows to about three feet and can take a fair amount of direct sun. And now it's time for another of my favorites, the male fern. Sometimes called the robust male fern, this guy was once considered rather rare. But it's made a comeback in the last decade or so and is now easy to find. It's also easy to grow, although it doesn't like to be planted in windy areas. Those are among the more common hardy ferns all of which are readily available at nurseries, garden centers, or from online sources. Now let's take a look at some of the tropical ferns, which can also be used in the landscape or grown as houseplants. The granddaddy of them all is the Australian tree fern, which can get up to 20 feet tall in its native land. In a container here on my patio, it'll grow to about six feet or so before the first frost. But in the meantime, it's sure cool to look at, both from above and from down under. The bird's nest fern gets its name from the way the leaves spread from the crown to form a nest. Now, to be honest, I've never actually had a bird nest in one of these things, but I suppose it could happen someday. Oh, and one more thing. The bird's nest fern makes a terrific house plant. Just remember, you got to mist it often, as in pretty much every day. Though not actually a fern, the asparagus fern nevertheless gets its name from its fern-like foliage and is indeed related to asparagus, the vegetable. I include it here because it makes a delightful container plant to boot. Next to last on the list is the Boston fern, by far and away the most popular fern on the planet and one of the most popular house plants ever. The Boston fern, whose origins can actually be traced to Florida, prefers moist soil but won't take well to overwatering. Boston ferns do great outdoors in the shade as well. Just make sure temperatures are above 50 degrees Fahrenheit before you bring them outdoors. Okay. Time now for the last fern of the day, which some folks say was actually named after me. It's the macho fern. Actually, I have no earthly idea how this fern got its common name, unless it has to do with the fact that within the world of ferns, it's a big one. Its texture is also a tad coarse, but it looks great in containers. Well, there you have a look at some of the best ferns for growing indoors or out. And believe me, there are dozens more. Now, one of the interesting things about ferns is they sometimes cross-fertilize. So in this bed, I'm going to plant a lady fern and a male fern just to see what happens. Up next, your plants may not be so fond of Fido. Your dog wants to use it in different ways than you do. How to make your garden a little more dog-friendly. Stumped by a problem in your garden? I'm thinking about designing and planting my gardens. I always keep in mind my two furry friends here, Maggie and Lucky. Hey, it's their space, too. If gardening is the most popular pastime in America and dogs are the most popular pets, then both must go together like two peas in a pod, right? Unfortunately, that's not always the case. But the plants and the pooch can coexist peacefully as long as we humans understand a few simple things. First, um, to have a spirit of compromise because you're both going to live in the space and your dog wants to use it sometimes in different ways than you do, so think about that. Second, to invest some time in training. Let's go, go to Judy. A basic training class will teach the dog to sit, stay, and come. But to take it to the next level, Cheryl uses the sound of a clicker, a dog on good treat, and a stone border to teach her dogs to stay out of the beds. I've chosen to use a consistent border throughout the landscape, which is either rock or cottage stone, pretty much the same thing to a dog, and to teach the dogs not to cross that, to see it as a boundary that they should not go by. And that involves some training, and it does take a few weeks of pretty high dedication on your part. Nestle. Cheryl walks Nestle here up to the stone border and stops. When he doesn't go in, she clicks, pets him, and gives him a treat. Do that enough times and he learns that anything surrounded by stone is off limits. If he forgets, a vocal command reminds him of the rules. Good job. 
Now, younger puppies may have a few memory lapses in the beginning. Because they like to chew on things like plants, Cheryl says steer clear of toxic plants in the landscape. Your vet or local poison control center should have a list of what to avoid. Here's something interesting. Dogs have a sweet tooth for fruits and vegetables. If you want first dibs on the harvest, raise your sights. What I found works really well, both for your vegetable garden and for the dogs, is to use raised beds. You can make a much nicer vegetable garden. You can keep it well tilled up and compost in it. And you can teach the dogs the same way as you did with boundary training. This is not a place that you can go. Another prevalent pooch problem is the propensity to dig. Some dogs, like Diamond here, like to dig. Trying to stop that behavior can be downright frustrating. And in dogs, frustration often comes out in two ways, barking or chewing. You'd probably prefer digging to either one of those. <laughs> the solution? Compromise. Instead of trying to stop the digging, give the dog a place to dig. It can be as simple as a mound of dirt. I mean, if you have a part of your yard that you aren't planning to plant in and you don't mind that there's a big mound of dirt and the dirt's gonna be thrown around all over the place, that's what I have here and that works just fine. The idea is to sanction digging in a place of your choosing. Cheryl does that by placing a few favorite treats in the mound where the dogs can easily find them. They dig, find the reward, and get plenty of reinforcement to go back for more. When you turn it on. Now for dogs that dig for vermin, a little more incentive is necessary. Like this battery operated chipmunk in a plastic bubble. And if you were playing inside, it would roll around on the floor and the dog would chase it. But for the terriers, we would turn one on and bury it in the pit because it's making a tremendous amount of vibration. The batteries will last a couple of days underground. And even when the dog finds the toy, its mouth probably isn't big enough to fit around the bubble. A dog's digging delight. Something else a dog needs in the yard is a place to do his business. And no, it doesn't have to be ugly. I took a little natural rectangle that existed alongside the deck, and rather than having lawn there, I put down wood chips. I put some plants at the back of it so it looks kind of nice. Even the creeping Jenny looks good after a tough winter. And here's a great idea. The wood chips are made of cedar to counteract offensive odors. The last thing every yard needs for their four-legged friends is a place to get some exercise. <laughs> Cheryl has a veritable playground in the backyard where Nestle and Diamond can run, jump, play, and then play some more. This doesn't take up much space, and in a very confined little space, you can get a lot of activity going, and plus it's physical and mental exercise, because you can direct them around it in different ways. They have to listen to your instructions. You can really get a lot done in a little area. The best part? Playing in the yard uses energy that might be spent digging or chewing elsewhere. And that, folks, is a win-win situation for you and the dogs. They say dogs are mankind's best friend. Makes sense that they should frolic happily in one of mankind's favorite places. How about that, Maggie and Lucky? A segment just for you guys. <laughs> Who loves you? Coming up next, got deer? I may have a solution. And then when it's empty, it's gonna rock back and hit that knocking piece, which is supposed to scare the deer. Three different designers go head to head. Controlling critters in the garden, deer are easily the most difficult to deter, which is why I've devoted entire segments to the subject in the past. With that thought in mind, however, today I want to present a deer deterrent that may seem new to you, but is in fact centuries old. It's a deer chaser. Now I'm gonna show you how this whole thing actually works in just a minute, but I just wanna demonstrate it here. Okay, water is gonna come into this spout and go down into this big piece of bamboo here. And the weight of the water is gonna force this piece of bamboo down. It'll then empty the water. And then when it's empty, it's gonna rock back and hit that knocking piece, which is supposed to scare the deer. Now this whole thing is actually driven by a pump that's powered by electricity. Hey, this is the modern version, okay? To install the deer chaser, you first need to dig a hole, ideally somewhere near an electrical source. The holes should be roughly two feet deep and at least a foot wide. I'll cover the hole with a pond liner 
leaving a little extra around the rim. Add river rocks about three quarters of the way up the hole and then trim the excess liner. I'll then position the deer chaser on the edge of the hole, place the pump in the hole on top of the rocks, add a few water plants, and fill the hole up to the top with more river rocks. And with that done, I'll fill the hole with water. And now it's time for the moment of truth. I'll plug in the power cord to the pump, and within seconds, the deer chaser will begin to do its thing. Can you hear the sound produced by the bamboo as it hits the knocking piece? Now it's time for a finishing touch, namely a few small pieces of limestone that I'll add around the edge of the hole. Hey, you know, this turned out better than I thought it would, and it works too. At least mechanically speaking. As to whether or not it'll actually scare away any deer, some people say yes, other people say no. In my case, I'll never know for sure because I don't have any deer around here. <laughs> Thank goodness. That's it for today. But remember, if you'd like to learn more about anything you've seen on today's show, just log on to our website. I'm Paul James. Now and then, I like to do a segment in which all I really do is garden. So today, I'm going to do just that. Now, I've got several plants that I'm going to stick in the ground and in containers, some of which may be unfamiliar to you. And my first stop is here in this bed I created and partially planted last fall. In this bare spot here, I've got a bit of a problem. You see, the soil here doesn't drain all that well. In fact, it stays pretty wet, especially during the spring and fall, and for several days after I water, even in summer. Now, I could do all kinds of things to solve the drainage problem, but all of those things would require a whole lot of work. So instead, I'm going to use a particular perennial, 11 of them, that thrives in moist conditions such as this. And that plant is the Siberian iris, also known as Iris Siberica. Hardy to zone three, this is one of my favorite irises. Its foliage is a good deal more slender than the more familiar Dutch iris, but its flowers, though smaller, are every bit as beautiful and usually emerge in late spring to early summer. This variety, called Caesar's Brother, produces a gorgeous deep blue flower, but other varieties sport blooms in sky blue and white with yellow. In time, these plants will form large clumps, and even after the flowers fade, the foliage, reminiscent of an ornamental grass, looks good until the first hard frost. Well, that's certainly an improvement. Now, I've spaced these babies roughly 18 inches apart, and in about three years, they'll spread to fill in the gaps. Oh, and one more great thing about this particular species of iris is that it's rarely bothered by the iris borer, which can be a royal pain. My next task is to plant a small tree that produces one of my all-time absolute favorite fruits. And that fruit is a fig, which of course makes this a fig tree. In this case, a variety known as Peter's honey. And look, it's already produced a fig. And another, and another. Oh, I'm so excited. Now, figs are only marginally hardy here in my neck of the woods. And even though I've got a friend who's had two in the ground for years, and they produce tons of fruit, I'm gonna put this one in a container just to be on the safe side. That way, if temperatures drop below, oh, 10 degrees or so, I can move it into the garage for safekeeping. And since this is a self-pollinating fig, I only need to plant one. Figs do need full sun and a fair amount of room to grow because they'll slowly reach a height of 15 to 25 feet with a nearly equal spread. In fact, in most cases, they're more like a large shrub than a tree at maturity, although this one has been trained as a tree. Unlike most other fruit trees, figs aren't bothered much by pests and diseases. However, hi Maggie, Birds love the ripe fruit, and they'll strip an entire tree in a day. Consequently, it's a good idea to put some bird netting over the tree once the fruit begins to ripen. Up next is another tree, one that I couldn't resist buying, even though it's a notorious sucker. This is a dwarf black locust called Twisty Baby, and it's easy to see how it got its name. I mean, hey, talk about contorted. Hardy the zone four, this tree or shrub will ultimately get up to 15 feet tall and 15 feet wide. And as cool as it is, it's got one substantial downside. It's suckers. Like nearly all locusts, this thing will likely send up suckers all over the place. And keeping them in check can be a real nightmare. However, unlike a lot of other locusts, it is nearly thornless. 
Anyway, to avoid having to deal with all those suckers, I'm gonna plant this thing in a rather large pot where it should do nicely. And by growing it in a container, it isn't likely to get as big as it would if planted in the ground. I'll also prune it once a year to keep its growth in check and to encourage more contorted branches. Ooh, I like it a lot. So, what's next? You know, something that grows in shade would be kind of nice. And this cute little Brunnera or Brunera fits the bill. This is Jack Frost, a dynamite perennial with some of the most striking silver foliage I've ever seen. Hardy to minus 25 degrees, this baby will ultimately grow to about 10 inches tall and wide. Now, it requires moist, rich, well-drained soil and a good deal of shade. Although in the north, it can handle a few hours of morning sun. Notice the way the foliage of this plant brightens up a shade garden. Oh, and by the way, it also produces cute sky blue flowers. Here's another great plant for shade, one that also produces gorgeous blue flowers. And by the way, I'm sorry not everything's in flower today. Anyway, this is an aconitum, or monk's hood, known as Bressingham Spire. This popular perennial will grow to about 24 inches tall when given the conditions it requires. Cool, fertile soil and plenty of moisture. Here's a neat ground cover. This is a variegated form of the ever-popular Pachysandra, also known as Japanese Spurge. And what's great about this stuff is that it grows well where few other plants will, such as beneath the shade of mature trees. And its silvery white leaf margins also brighten up otherwise dark, shady areas. And how about this tropical beauty? This is called the Carnation of India, and its green, glossy leaves are the perfect backdrop for its gorgeous, white, ruffled flowers. Although, unfortunately, it doesn't smell. Good or bad. Moving right along, here's a relatively new introduction of a popular shade-tolerant ground cover commonly known as bugleweed. This is an ajuga called black scallop. It only grows about four inches tall, but it's hardy to zone three. And I don't know about you, but oh, I just adore its chocolate-colored foliage. Ajuga is a great ground cover, but being a member of the mint family, I should warn you that it can be invasive. You know, one of the reasons I'm so drawn to ajuga is, well, it's because its name is identical to the sound my dad makes when he sneezes. Ajuga! Excuse me. Anybody got a tissue? Up next, what do you say to a Q&A? Hey, PJ, can I grow orchids outdoors in Zone 6? Wow, no one's called me PJ since high school. But to answer your question, yes, you can grow one particular orchid outdoors as a perennial in Zone 6, even Zone 5 with winter protection in the form of mulch. The orchid in question is in the genus Blatilla, an Asian native that grows to about 18 inches and produces rosy purple flowers in late spring that last for about two to three weeks. These babies require rich, moist soil that drains really well. If the soil doesn't drain really well, they'll rot pretty quickly. So treat them kindly, not only because they're beautiful, but also because they can be a tad expensive. And by the way, if you can't find these hardy orchids at your local nursery, check online and catalog sources. So how do you keep plants from bolting? Well, bolting, or the process of going to flower, isn't always a bad thing, especially when what you're growing is flowers. But in the case of certain vegetables and herbs, bolting is the last thing you want them to do. This Mitsuna, for example, a Japanese green, is bolting in response to warm weather, which is the number one cause of premature bolting. Cutting off the flower stalk will arrest the process momentarily, but in time the plant will send up a replacement stalk. Bolting diverts energy from the production of foliage, and foliage after all is what you want from Mitsuna as well as most other greens, into the production of flowers and seeds. As a result, the plant practically stops producing any additional foliage, and what it does produce very often isn't all that flavorful. Not bad, but not great. The best way to prevent premature bolting is to plant early in the season. That's particularly true of plants that are notorious for bolting, such as this cilantro, which sadly is about to bolt. Why are you supposed to remove flowers from culinary herbs? That's a related question, actually. You see, when herbs flower, they too channel their energy into flower and seed production, 
which in turn slows the production of aromatic oils and other compounds that give herbs their desired and distinctive flavors. But again, you can slow down or even interrupt the process altogether by simply removing the flowers as they appear. So tell me, what is a wetting agent? Wetting agents, also known as surfactants, are used to make various garden chemicals such as pesticides, fertilizers, herbicides, and so on stick better to plant leaves, especially plants with really waxy leaves. Typically, only a small amount of wetting agent is required, say less than a tablespoon per gallon. As to whether you actually need a wetting agent, well, I don't want to be the one to decide. I know people who use them all the time, but then again, I never use them. So Paul, what in the world is neem? Neem is an all-natural garden chemical that's made from the subtropical neem tree. And in my opinion, it's one of the absolute greatest discoveries of the century for gardeners faced with all kinds of pest and disease problems. Available as a liquid concentrate or ready-to-use spray, neem controls dozens of insects. From sod webworms to Japanese beetles to white flies, it isn't toxic to birds, beneficial insects, and animals, including humans. However, some plants are sensitive to it, so make sure you read the product label carefully. Neem also controls a number of different fungal diseases, which makes it a multi-purpose, all-in-one pest and disease control product. <laughs> hey, what more do you want? I gotta ask you, Paul, can gardeners in the South grow delphiniums? Well, until recently, I'd have said no. Not a chance, no way, ain't gonna happen, uh-uh, forget about it. Because delphiniums simply can't handle the heat of the South. But growers in New Zealand have come up with a new delphinium hybrid that can handle not only the heat, but believe it or not, the high humidity of the South. And these new hybrids require the same growing conditions as other delphiniums. Moist, well-drained soil, and especially in the South, no more than two or three hours of morning sun followed by shade the rest of the day. What can you tell me about so-called plant growth enhancers? Plant growth enhancers are showing amazing promise. And the most promising of all is one that contains a bacterial protein called harpin, which occurs naturally in plants. What the protein does is stimulate a plant's defense and growth responses, which makes the plant grow stronger and makes it more resistant to attack by pests and diseases. To use, you simply mix the powdered product with water and spray the foliage of plants. And by the way, this stuff works on flowers and vegetables, trees and shrubs, even lawns. Plant growth enhancers may, in time, virtually eliminate the need for conventional pesticides and fungicides. Now, I know that's a pretty bold statement, but they truly do represent a whole new approach to pest and disease control. They're also perfectly safe to use. Hey, gardener guy, seen any neat tropical plants lately? As a matter of fact, yes. Just last weekend, I was at a nursery in Pontiac, Michigan, where I saw all kinds of cool tropicals. But the other day at a local nursery, I came across this cutie, an acolypha called Ceylon. Also known as copper leaf, this Zone 10 tropical makes a great patio or house plant, growing to only 18 inches, and its coloration is absolutely gorgeous. Don't you think? Paul, have you lost a little weight? Actually, I have dropped a few pounds recently, 15 to be exact. But I gotta tell you, I battle with my weight all the time and have for years. As a matter of fact, back in high school, in addition to being called peach time not so long ago when lightly colored plants would simply scorch in the sunlight. But thanks to the ever expanding world of plant breeding, you can now buy all kinds of plants in yellows and golds that don't need a slathering of sunscreen. And here's the guru of gold, Karen Platt, all the way from Sheffield, England, to tell us more about the colors of honey. There's been a gold rush in the plant kingdom, folks. It takes the form of these coveted nuggets, gold plants. I've turned into a gold digger. You gotta admit, these beauties do exude a certain opulence. The kind of riches a gold digger just might seek out. But this is the kind of gold that you put in your garden to make the garden shine just like the sun, even when the clouds are gray. Karen should know she spent years digging up over 1,300 different gold plants. 
golden spines, not just foliage and flowers. Just look at the long spines on this baby. Good point, Karen. Gold can refer to a plant's spikes, blades, flowers, foliage colors, variegation, or veining. Now, some folks might think that gold would look ghastly in a planting, but Karen says yes, it gives the garden a golden opportunity to glow. A lot of people are afraid of gold. Yellow plants, and they think, oh! It's just going to look too much. And some of them do shout really, really loud. But there are some nice, soft, sensuous yellows. One golden way to temper yellow's exuberance, plant it amongst a variety of contrasting colors. And gold is a great intermingler. It, it will add a little touch of sparkle. It looks great against dark green, black. It looks wonderful with pastels, because you can get those pastel lemon flowers as well. We have a wonderful range of golden plants here to demonstrate the subtle differences in color. But you can also bring up the brightness of many golden plants by simply adding sunlight. Your gold plants are going to look maybe a little chartreuse or greeny if they're not getting a lot of sun. Some gold plants do actually like some shade and they won't take really hot afternoon sun that you get like in the southern United States. Um, but they do like some sun to bring out that real gold color. So the question is, can gold in the garden really look like a million bucks? I want to show you how to make a nine carat gold container. For all those plants, Karen, you'd better start with a large container. That'll work. This has some lovely colors in it. And Karen says don't skimp on the soil. Light, well-draining soil is worth its weight in gold for containers. Okay, on to the plants. You need one or two trailers, this lovely Vinca illumination. Its gold leaves will shine all summer long, and it has these lovely, cute little flowers. A plant trailing over the edge helps soften the container and draw the eye down. Next to that goes a new amber-colored heuchera. This also has a, a nice wavy edge to it, which contrasts with the smaller, smooth, oval shape of the vinca. This beauty gets a gold star on my walk of fame, Sedum Angelina for touchable texture. Again, it's going to get even more golden as the season progresses. For contrast, Karen uses the dark leathery leaves of this big burginia to up the wattage of the surrounding yellows. This is Carex Ogon, one of the most fabulous golden grasses that you can find. The upright grass shines this brightly year-round, especially when next to this lofty colocasia, a trailing lysimachia, appropriately named Goldilocks, and a dark star from the Coleus clan. This planter has color, texture, dimension, and beauty. There's only one thing missing, gold flowers. I love foliage on its own, but with a flower in this, I think you'll agree that this looks superb. Now there's a container that's worth its weight in gold. So why not catch gold fever? A bright way to bring warmth and sunshine to your garden. And they're just cheering. But they make you happy. That, that's what the color yellow is, is supposed to symbolize. It's a happy color. So if you want a little happiness in, in your garden, this is a superb choice of color. Thanks, Karen, for your Midas touch. And by the way, Karen says that one of her favorite groups of golden plants for the shade garden includes just about anything in the hosta family. So if you're looking to add a little sunshine to a shady spot, hosta la vista, baby. Stay tuned, I've got one more plant to go. I've got just enough time to plant one more plant, and it's one I'm gonna pot up in a container. 
The plant in question is this Uriops pectinatus viridis, which I'm sure you've seen for sale at your local nursery. Oh, and by the way, I'm sorry to say that so far as I know, this plant has no common name. Although I think overgrown daisy would be appropriate. Anyway, I'm planting this thing primarily to maintain marital bliss. You see, my wife Carrie loves this plant and, well, enough said. And as you can see, I'm planting it in a fairly large container. After all, before the end of the growing season, it can grow to five feet tall. And for months to come, it'll continue to produce these nice yellow flowers. So long as I remember to deadhead, that is, remove the spent flowers every other day or so. Or every week, or, well, whenever I get around to it. In zones 8 through 11, this plant can be grown as an evergreen. In fact, I've seen it used extensively in tropical and subtropical gardens as a single shrub or specimen, or even as a hedge. You can also train it as a standard, that is, a tree-like form with a straight trunk topped by a whole bunch of flowers and foliage. But here on my patio, I'll grow it as an annual, knowing that once temperatures drop below freezing, it will have served its purpose. And now, having added this to my patio plantings, Carrie will think I'm the greatest guy in the world. <laughs> Of course, she already thinks that, but it never hurts to reinforce the feeling now and then. You know what I mean? I don't know what you're going to do the rest of the day, but as for me, I'm just going to sit here and enjoy my new plants. I'm Paul James, the gardener guy for Gardening by the Yard. Thanks for watching.